Today we are going to look at Hagia Sophia, so we are up at the crack of dawn. Remember, the man said get there early to beat the queue. And we also want to see the Basilica Cistern. Apparently there are hundreds of these cisterns, mainly from Constantinople days. They are large holding tanks for water, some of which were no doubt filled with water carried by that Valens aqueduct which we saw earlier. Well, as you can see, we've walked up to the square and there is the queue. That man must have told everybody to get there early. Right. We'll go on and have a look at the Basilica Cistern. It's only just across the road. Just look at that house over there. It's one of those nice old wooden Istanbul houses. Rather like the Yalis on the Bosphorus. And this stone pillar here is what remains of an Ottoman water tower. Next to it is what remains of the million from where all mileages were measured. Oh, looks like there's a bit of a queue for the cistern as well. Well, come on, let's go for it. Well, we're struggling for light a bit down here, but you get the idea. I don't know how this music comes across to you on film, but it certainly seemed to me to produce the right atmosphere down there. This thing is like a cathedral built underground, both in size and its structure. It has all these 30 foot high monumental marble columns, 336 of them, mainly pinched from older temples, and the whole thing measures 453 feet by 212 feet or 138 meters by 64 meters if you prefer. It was built for Emperor Justinian sometime around 532 AD. I understand that in the film From Russia with Love James Bond is seen rowing a little boat around here. The whole thing is supposed to be underneath the Russian embassy. I'm afraid I've not seen that film. Now just look at this column here. Those carvings are apparently called hen's eyes. I wonder where they got that column from. Two columns nearby rest on blocks with a carving of Medusa's head. Medusa was the one who changed everybody she looked at into stone. These blocks would have come from an older building where they were put to protect that building from the evil spirits. Perhaps their use in a sideways and upside down position is a statement from the new religion. Right, we've seen the system now and the queue is still there for Hagia Sophia so we'll have to sit in the Stambul sun for a bit longer it is Sunday after all and look here's mummy pussycat out with her three little ones 
Come on, the queue's not getting any smaller. Let's go in. Just remember those buttresses for later. We're now in the narthex or entrance porch and this picture is above the main west door into the church. And here we have the emperor bowing down before Christ enthroned and representations of the Virgin Mary and the Archangel Gabriel. Remember that like at St. Saviour in Cora, all these pictures were covered in plaster when the building became a mosque, which then had to be chipped off and some damage may have occurred. And looking to our right, we can see the side entrance through which we entered. The central door behind us is for the Emperor only. There are many remarkable things here. The most remarkable thing about this building, to me, is the fact that it was built in the early 530s AD. It was inaugurated in 537. Now, the name, Hagia Sophia. It doesn't mean, as I always thought, Saint Sophia. It means Holy Wisdom, the Church of the Holy Wisdom of God. It is believed that a church was first built on this site in the 300s. Some say it was built for Constantius II, though it is quite likely that Constantius was actually repairing an earthquake damaged building erected for Constantine, and he died in 337. Either way, that first church was burned down in riots around 404 AD. Let's look at the pictures on the four pendatives of the main dome. What are they? Some say cherubs, some say seraphs. Anyway, whatever they are, they were not totally covered up when the building became a mosque. But only their faces were covered up. This one has been restored. Here we can see the gallery. We'll have a look up there later if we can find a lift. But I don't know if they had lifts in 5.30. Then I found this column, which has a hole into which you put your thumb and make a wish or say a prayer. So I did. Then this. It's a marble job from Pergamon. Looking eastward now into the apse, we have Mary with baby Jesus on her lap. When the building became a mosque, the altar was removed from this area and a mihrab and minbar were installed. Yes, young man, you may well stand there open-mouthed looking up there like that. Can you imagine what effect this place had on the ordinary 6th century Byzantine peasant? While we're up here, let's look at these big medallions. I am told that on each medallion is painted a name. The names are Allah, Muhammad, the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali, and the two grandsons of Muhammad, Hassan and Hussein. I am told that the central dome here is over 180 feet or 55 meters above the floor level. If we now go back out into the narthex and turn right, there is an access to the gallery. And although it's not a lift or elevator, it is a ramp and we can manage that. 
Remember we said that the first church on this site had been burned down in riots in 404 AD. Well, a second church was ordered by Theodosius II and inaugurated in 415. This second building was also burned down in riots in 532. Within 40 days of those riots being quelled, the then Emperor Justinian, who, remember, also built that basilica cistern, ordered the building of a new church. To build it, he chose a physicist, Isidore of Miletus, and a mathematician, Anthemius of Thrales. Justinian wanted an incomparable structure to be built and no expense was spared. Building materials were brought from many parts of the empire, porphyry from Egypt, green marble from Thessaly, black stone from the Bosphorus area, yellow stone from Syria. Many columns were taken from the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, so now we know where they went, don't we? We'll just have a look out of the window before we go in. Have another look at some buttresses. The gallery runs in a sort of horseshoe shape along the north, west and south sides of the building. This central part here was reserved for the Empress and her court, from where they could observe the proceedings below. To our right, along the south gallery, we find these doors made out of marble. Beyond them, we can look at some of the mosaics. Here we have Jesus Christ with the Virgin Mary on the left and John the Baptist on the right. This has been dated to about 1261 and a lot of it is missing as you can see. Nearby is this panel which obviously someone has made to give an idea what it looked like when it was complete. Now we see the Virgin Mary with the infant Jesus on her lap. To the left is Emperor John II Comnenus and to the right Empress Irene. In this picture we see Jesus Christ and to the left Emperor Constantine the Ninth Monomachus and to the right Empress Zoe. This area was used for synods and council meetings. The second and sixth general church councils were held here. Perhaps you remember that fourth crusade which we talked about earlier and that it was led by the Doge of Venice towards Constantinople and that the Doge Enrico Dandolo died here. Well, if you look round now you will see this. And here is the grave. That fourth crusade was actually supposed to land in Egypt, but the Phoenicians had big trade interests there which they didn't want disrupting. The Phoenicians said to the crusaders, we will supply your ships free, terms and conditions apply. We're just going to move round to the North Gallery now. And the terms were, if you help us to capture Constantinople, we will let you share the booty. But why attack Constantinople? Well, if Constantinople could be knocked out, then Venice would have practically a monopoly of east-west trade. And here was a heaven-sent opportunity, you might say, to achieve that aim. 
but how did the Venetians get the Pope to at least turn a blind eye to all this? Well, the Eastern churches, headquartered in Constantinople, would not recognize the Pope as supreme head of the church on earth. So it might quite suit the Pope if Constantinople happened to get smashed, weakened and regime changed. Right, let's have a quick look out the window before we leave. Oh, that's a good idea. Look, bring your own chair. It's another ramp. Doing this yes, watch what you're doing. We don't want anything happening to that camera. Ah, that's a bit better surface this time. Not the shiny, slippery cobbles. A proper 21st century Ford concrete. Right now we're on the steps. So that's the church that Justinian built. Apart from anything else, it was the biggest church in the world and remained so for a thousand years. Although a marvellous achievement, the finished product wasn't entirely trouble free. The dome has had to be repaired several times and due to building movements, it is now actually elliptical rather than circular. Bosses have had to be added at times, including some during Ottoman days, to hold up the walls and prevent it from collapse. But its builders, who as we said weren't actually architects anyway, were working on the frontiers of the technology of building. Their efforts and new techniques developed as they went along have been described as the culminating achievement of late antiquity and the first masterpiece of Byzantine architecture. I am still finding it difficult to take in that this thing was built in the 530s AD. It was a wonder when it opened and was unparalleled for a thousand years. It's quite easy to believe the story that Justinian said, Solomon, I have outdone thee. And now, a few steps down the road, we have Topkapi Palace.